uh, start over in Luke chapter 10, if you want to be opening your Bible to Luke chapter 10. But uh, before we do that, we want to have uh, some prayer requests. And I do have the bulletin with me, so I'll be praying through those. But if you have a request that may not be in the bulletin, let me know. And uh, we'd love to uh, be praying for those this evening as well. So, anybody have a prayer request? See none? You probably already got Pam on there. I, okay. Her, her second round of treatment. Oh, get more specific. Bob's just uh, asking for prayers, prayers for Pam. Her uh, second round of treatment starts on Friday. And uh, passing around a, a card for Terry Duffin uh, from our class, so make sure you get a chance to sign that as well. And we'll get that sent off to her. You know, well, I don't think I ever knew anybody that was going through chemo that came to church and did all the things that Pam's doing. It's you, pretty, it's amazing. she's amazing. Ross has a prayer request. Carol Sturdivant has uh, COVID-19, so pray for her and all of her, the rest of her family hasn't gotten it, hopefully they won't. Carol Sturdivant uh, has COVID-19 and uh, none of the rest of her family has it as far as we know. So we'll just be praying for Carol for healing and hope things will have a positive outcome for her and maybe protection for her husband, Jim, especially. So anyway, so there's outlines right there, Pam, if you want to grab one. And Diana, if you want to, there's two, two, two different ones, one stapled and one's not, so. Great, so we're gonna, any other prayer requests that, uh, we've got a, a card for Terry Duffin that we're, we're sending around uh, the, the class as well. We'd love to have people sign that. If you haven't had the opportunity to do that, please, please feel free to do that. Any other prayer requests this evening? that aren't in the bulletin. I've got those, Diana? No, I was just gonna give an update. Um, Trey had his treatment, his last treatment for round two on Monday, and uh, was so sick Sunday night that he called and asked me to come take him. Wow. It's pretty bad when he's, he's calling for mommy. He's been really hesitant to, to call me, of all people. <laughs> so, you know, that young man, I don't want my mommy. He's, he's independent. Yeah, you know, and, yeah. But so. he knew who to call when he needed someone. Yeah, so we went down there and took it to his last treatment for round two, and then we brought him home because he was just, there was no one to care I for him. I thought he was here. I thought he was still. He is in Dillon, so I went down to Dillon, yeah. took him to Butte to his treatment, and then I brought him home here because he needed someone to take care of him for the week. Mm -hmm. Any other prayer requests this evening? Is that your son you were talking about? Yes. Okay. We'll pray for him, and uh, we do have that card going around. If, when you get done, Diana, we may be passed over to Steph, and you can bring it up to, to Bill over here. So let's go ahead and pray. Well, you are a great and awesome God. You are full of mercy and compassion and grace and love, and we just praise you for all those great attributes. And Well, we thank you so much for your word that uh, gives us uh, new stories to help us understand uh, life better and perhaps replace some of the stories that we have in our, our brain from maybe our time uh, outside of our relationship with you or just our family upbringing or whatever. And we thank you for the, the great uh, story of the parable of the Good Samaritan that we'll be looking at this evening. And we pray that our hearts and our minds would be open to you and to your word. Father, we uh, want to continue to pray for, for those uh, who, who may be struggling in various ways. Perhaps some of them uh, have not yet uh, become Christians. We just pray for their salvation. Others uh, 
perhaps are uh, wrestling in their, their marriages. We pray for them and healing for them. And Father, we want to uh, continue to pray for Dale and healing from his uh, repair to the aorta and quadruple bypass. And pray for Trey. We pray that you give him health and comfort during these difficult days and healing uh, from his uh, chemo. And well, we also pray for Laura. That's pray for healing for her situation and uh, also for Jack and Wendy. We pray for healing for both of them and for Lori, also for her shoulder. Pray that uh, she could be feeling better and get the help that she needs to, to feel better also. We also pray for Ben and uh, having his uh, prostate surgery. We pray that that'll, uh, he could be healed in that process. And also for Forrest and Betty as they uh, wrestle with uh, the dementia that Forrest has. And we well, pray for Carla's mom as she goes through uh, chemo. I pray for healing for her. We thank you that that's going very well thus far and pray that would continue. And also we, we pray for Terry and uh, pray that things would continue on a, a positive note there. Again, be with all of her medical providers and give them a special measure of guidance and direction and wisdom. Father, and uh, pray for Stacy and her health and for Pam as uh, she continues her treatment on Friday and pray that that would go well and I pray that she could uh, endure the, the side effects of that. We know that that's uh, not always a pleasant process and Father, I would just pray for, for Pam in that special way. We continue to pray for Martha as well and healing for her and the, the sale of the, the Hungate's home and Father, we want to uh, pray for uh, Shirley's mom, Jessie, as she uh, transitions into assisted living. And we uh, participate in that process this weekend. Pray that things could go well for all of us. And we pray for Matt as he'll be preaching on Sunday that you'd give him a ready recollection of the things that he prepared. And uh, Father, just give him insight into your word and pray that his message would have a, a profound impact in all of our lives. Well, we also pray for healing for Carol and uh, for safety and security and protection for Jim and uh, the others that uh, she may have been around. Father, we, we love you and we thank you so much for Jesus. We pray that uh, you could help us become more and more like him as, as our days go by. And uh, Father, we just uh, Thank you for every person here today and pray that we could have a, a great discussion. Pray that you would guide us in our conversation this evening. It's in Jesus' name we give thanks and pray. Amen. Amen. So the opening question is, have you ever been helped by a stranger? And, and if so, what happened? Um, as most of you know, I ride my bicycle a fair amount especially in the warmer weather, but this winter I've been riding a little bit. And what, what can happen on a bicycle is your chain over time will stretch a little bit and it doesn't take much stretch for it to need to be replaced. And so when it's getting toward that uh, end of its useful life cycle uh, and you shift your gears and it will sometimes come off the front chain ring, at least on my bike, and drop down on, on that bottom bracket is what it's called. And so that happens to me every once in a while and then I go get a new chain, but uh, it did happen to me one day and, and I was very impressed because uh, people stopped. I, I can repair it myself, it's just, you know, you get a little greasy on your fingers or whatever, but it's, it's not uh, very bad. But I'll have my bike upside down working on it and people will stop and say, can I, can I give you a ride? Can I, can I help you? Do you need help? Can I call somebody? And so, you know, in Great Falls, I found out that there's really actually quite a few helpful people, or we could call them, quote unquote, good Samaritans to uh, bicyclists like myself anyway. So how about the rest of you? Have you been helped uh, by a stranger? Uh, and if so, what, what happened? Tell me about it. Tell us about it. Pam? Um, quite a few years ago, Bob and I were snowmobiling with um, our three children, and Believe it or not, we went up to Showdown or Kings Hill where the parking lot is for snowmobiles and we got lost. I still don't know how we got lost. So 
three children that were probably one, four, or two, four, and seven, and we're lost. And we're running out of gas. We have these two old sleds. And so Bob said, well, I will go get help. Well, he didn't know where he was going. And so I stayed there with the three kids. And Lacey, who was our oldest, or still is, she goes, Mom, what are we going to do? Because it was me and the three kids. And thank goodness Corey was sleeping, our oldest son, because he would have been panicking. The other two were fine. <laughs> and um, I said, well, Lacey, we only have one choice. And that is we're going to pray. We're going to pray that God rescues us because there's no other choice out here. Because I knew Bob could not go get anybody because he's going to run out of gas too. So we prayed, and it was probably five minutes later, and the sun's going down. It's getting dark. And I hear, I said, listen, Lacey, listen to God sending angels. And he sent these three guys on three sleds out in the boonies where we were, and they took us. And when we're going along, he... We left my sled because it was almost out of gas. No, one of the guys rode my sled. We loaded on the other two sleds. And here's Bob's sled about a, uh, about a mile up the road. He'd run out of gas, too. And we would have frozen to death. Oh, my goodness. And um, so we didn't go do too many snowmobile trips after that because I was too freaked out after that. But God provided. It was so awesome. Amen. It was a great demonstration of faith for me and to the children. So, so Pam just shared for those who may be listening online about a uh, snowmobile rescue that uh, happened with uh, she and Bob and their, their three children and uh, some, some people that they didn't know came by and, and basically perhaps saved their lives anyway, uh, very likely. Ross? It was fairly early in our marriage. Sue and I were traveling to the west coast of Washington and going to a uh, evangelism seminar out there. And our car was pretty basic and not in the greatest shape, but we got to Spokane and the car just kind of died. And we knew Jesus. We didn't know anyone in Spokane. So we prayed about it and we thought, well, let's contact the church and see if anyone there can help us. And so we called and they connected us with a really nice older couple that took us into their home and let us spend a night or two there. And he basically knew everybody that could fix our car and they got our car fixed and we were on our way. It was just an amazing example of uh, God's people taking care of Silly young people. So Ross just uh, shared for those of us that uh, might be listening or watching online about me traveling and car breaking down in Spokane and calling the, the church and getting some uh, brother, brother and sister who helped uh, not only provide lodging and I'm guessing maybe even food and, and uh, insight into mechanics that could uh, help repair their car. Anybody else? Steph. Well, when I was about, I'm not sure, probably seven or eight years old, we lived in a trailer court on the Milk River in Glasgow. And uh, this was the, the beginning of my fishing career. Anyway, I had this, this fishing pole, I, you know, just a, I don't even know where I got it from, but I only had one lure. And I used to go down to the, the Milk River going about probably 100 feet from our house, trader, it's on our everyday fish. Well, one day I caught a fish, first one. And I didn't know what to do with it, but I, I grabbed it, I walked around, I showed everybody the trailer court that I could see. Anyway, one of the places I stopped, he says, well, what are you gonna do with it? And I said, well, I don't know. He says, well, and, he, and he showed me how to dress it up, you know, to cut it off. And that was, I've, all, I've never forgotten that. Uh, but anyway, it was just kind of a, a deep, you know, pretty deep thing. Well, Steph just uh, shared a story about uh, as a young lad of seven or eight, he went fishing and uh, he only had one lure and he ac actually caught a, a fish and he didn't really know how to clean fish and that so he showed everybody, took it around, showed everybody in the trailer park where he lived and this, this guy says, hey, do you, what are you going to do with it? And 
he says, I don't know. And the guy showed him how to uh, clean, the, clean the fish so that it could be eaten. Well, let's just move on for the, the sake of time. You'll see here, I just have uh, what I've called, kind of D6 calls it the same thing, uh, family doorposts. And, and these are just kind of basic principles that, that we accept from God's word, that God exists, that God created the universe and everything in it, that the Bible is God's word, that uh, I'm engaged in spiritual warfare, that sin brought death and destruction into the world, I need a savior, I'm a special creation of God. God offers a life of salvation by grace through faith in Jesus. Uh, bad things happen because of this world is a sinful place. Uh, God established a home to make disciples and transfer faith. And God established a church to make disciples and transfer faith. And Jesus Christ is the sovereign Lord of all. Any of you have any thoughts about these doorposts? You're kind of going back to the concept of, of writing God's word on our doorposts and, and transferring these concepts to our family. Anybody have any? Bill? I, like, I always like the language of transferring faith because no generation is born with a fully functioning theology already in their mind and heart. It has to be transferred and learned and accepted and applied. Um, if not, we always say we're just one generation away from the church not mm -hmm. So we have to transfer it deliberately if we want it to continue. Good. Good. I appreciate that. Well, the one that, that I like uh, is that God offers a life of salvation by grace through faith in Jesus. And I, I think for many people, salvation is an event. And certainly that event is crucial and essential but it's really a life that follows after that event. It's kind of like what we talk about, the marriage ceremony. The, the wedding is important and essential, but it's really the life of marriage that's really much more important than that one day. And so I, I like that concept of the life uh, of salvation. It's not just a, a one and done type of thing. Anybody else? Let's go ahead and read Luke chapter 10, and if I could get somebody to read 25 through 29. And as we read through here, just what do you notice about this scholar who is well versed in scripture? Uh, what do you notice about this, this individual? Anybody want to read, Bill? 25 and 29. Please. I have the ESV. And behold, the lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Evening, Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Okay, so what, what do you notice about this... Uh scholar who is well well versed in scripture. What do you, you notice about, about him? Anything uh, stand out as we, we read that? I'll, I'll start us out. It seemed like he was wanting to test Jesus, discredit him possibly. It doesn't sound like he's really asking with uh, pure motives. He's, he's got some ulterior motives in asking that question and Sometimes we'll have discussions with people and we kind of have to wonder why are they asking this question? Is this sincere or is there some kind of agenda that's be behind it, so to speak? What else do we notice, Bill? I mean, not only is he, he's not on a sincere quest for truth. And Jesus makes that, I think, pretty clear because he immediately had the answer to Jesus' first question, which was his own question. He knew the answer to it. So, I mean, the text says he was trying to test Jesus. But I also think, given verse 29, he was looking for a loophole mm -hmm. to get out of doing what he already knew he was supposed to do. So, so Bill shared that it seemed like he was also looking for a loophole 
Um, you know, our tax code has a lot of loopholes in that, that, and so, you know, that's why we go to our tax preparer to see if we're saving the money that we can save and, and that kind of thing. But here this guy, supposedly, he's, he's a, a scholar well-versed in scripture, but as Bill says, he might be looking for a loophole. Betty? That's true, but he may have wondered about uh, to what extent do I have have to go to. I mean, we wonder about it a lot of times. What we, what our requirement is, or what what's expected of us. Sure, sure. So, so Betty says, well, maybe he did have some doubts uh, of his own understanding, and uh, he just really wanted to, for sure, know what God's expectations are. Uh, of him. He mentioned one of the categories of non-neighbors. Okay. <laughs> so so he, he, he didn't want to be neighborly, <laughs> is what, we, what we're going to find out as we study this. So he's like, uh, I, I'm okay being all alone on a mountain worshiping God, but you know, these people that I have to live with, you know, he, maybe his attitude was, it's awful hard to fly with the eagles and you have to live with the turkeys. <laughs> you know, maybe that was his attitude. Ross? It's interesting that he asked, what must I do? Okay. A lot of people think it doesn't really matter what you do, as long as you believe, as long as you have some mental acceptance uh, of some certain things in your mind and in your heart. And Jesus didn't rebuke him about that. Mm -hmm. So, it, it, you know, Ross is just making a comment that his question is, what do I need to do? And so he at least had the connection between faith and action, it seems like. So that, that would be a positive thing about him, that there, there certainly are things that our faith would cause us to do. And uh, that... Jeff. Well, I was just kind of thinking that um, he was a scholar of the law, but he knew about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that the Jewish people were, quote unquote, God's chosen people. And I'm thinking that maybe he didn't want to work on his prejudices. Everybody's prejudiced in one way. I remember mm -hmm. somebody asked me, So, so Jeff uh, commented that perhaps there's some, some prejudice involved here and not, not understanding uh, a lot of things. We, we see that Jesus uses an example that could definitely create, uh, uh, I guess, some discomfort for someone who was prejudiced, that's, that's for sure. I just wrote down a couple of things. Uh, it seems like he maybe wanted to read the law the way he wanted to. Uh, he kind of has a, a, maybe a neat system, uh, love with limits. And of course, then what we talked about earlier, that he wants to justify himself. He's going to make some excuses. We find out in verse 29, uh, rationalize it. And we're all trying to do that, don't we? We, we kind of make excuses. We rationalize. We justify our behavior at times because... Uh, we're, we're not really following God as sincerely as, as we could. He did get the message, though. Yeah, he, he did hear the truth of God's word, didn't he, uh, from Jesus. And what's significant about Jesus' response to his question? 
What, what did you note anything about Jesus' response to his question? I, I started out just saying, well, I think Jesus connected with him on some common ground. The law, you know, he, he really knew that, and I think that's really important for us to think about with people as well, trying to connect on some level with them. It may, in this day and age, it's probably not on the law of God. That wouldn't be our best connection with a lot of people. Maybe it would be with some, but it, it could be a hobby or work, or it could be uh, living in a certain part of town or, or a lot of those kinds of things. It's a good thing for us to think about. What else do you do you notice about how Jesus responded to his question? He wasn't in a judgmental manner. Okay. He kind of asked him a question back, right? He was non non-judgmental. And uh, really he just he just kind of spoke plainly the the truth of God's word to him. Good, Betty. Jeff and then Bill. Amen. Jesus, Jesus was the same way. He said, well, how do you, how do you perceive this? How do you, what do you think about this? Well, like that he said, that was not judgmental. He didn't say, are you crazy? No. You should know this. <laughs> you, you're asking me this question? Yeah. I mean, why? <laughs> so, so Jeff just said, you know, he's, he's trying to get him to explain, uh, you know, kind of almost saying, help me understand your, your question, you know, help me understand where you're coming from with this. And so a good, good point. Kind of commends him for having the correct answer. You know, at least he has the correct answer. He might, might mean doesn't have the correct understanding and application in his life, but he does have the, the correct answer. And then, but then he challenges him, doesn't he? He challenges him to live it out. You know, are you living this out? Uh, he, he says, you know, um, it's kind of like what I've heard before. It's not the answers that I don't know that bother me. It's the answers that I do know from God's word. Because I need to be living those out, right? And, you know, it's kind of like that with, with this uh, scholar uh, who is well-versed in scripture. He, he knew the answer, but it kind of bothered him, I think. He knew what, what uh, God required. And so let's go read the next section, 30 through 37. And just to kind of give you a little context here, this, this road from Jerusalem to Jericho, uh, it's the kind of road you'd love to run a race on because it's all downhill. It's about, you drop about 3,300 feet of elevation in 17, 18 miles. Uh, and from the description of it, it sounded kind of like there's a lot of cliffs there, a lot of coolies, I would call them coolies coming from Montana. And so what came to my mind was this road that starts up high and then you go down to the Missouri River breaks down all the way to the bottom. And that's where the elk are, right? They're down in the bottom. But the real, real problem is then you've got to get them back up to the road. But it's kind of that kind of terrain it kind of sounded like to me. So there's a lot of robbers and, and bad guys there that could hide out in those little nooks and crannies and cliffs and they could easily push someone off the cliff and you know no one would ever find them. Uh, so let's go ahead and read 30 through 37. And as we do, what are some ways that the Samaritan practiced neighborliness? We're gonna move on to the positive here. And uh, just remember that uh, typically Samaritans hated Jews and uh, so this is uh, kind of an interesting story here that Jesus tells us. Who wants to read 30 through 37? Ross? Luke 10, starting in verse 30. In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. The priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, 
passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Okay. So what are some of these ways that the Samaritan practiced neighborliness. Uh, let's get us started as we think about it. He saw a need, you know, so he's using his eyes. He's, he seems to be looking around to meet needs. And, uh, you know, sometimes the, the other guys, the priest and the Levite, you know, they're like, <laughs> I got my blinders on. I don't want to see anything except straight ahead. And, you know, sometimes that's like us, right? We're busy, we got to get from point A to point B, and we maybe see someone in need, and uh, do we keep going or do we interrupt our schedule to do that? What else do we notice about our Samaritan in Jesus' story? Jeff? Well, I guess maybe it was probably pretty brave to go to Yeah. So I'm thinking the Samaritan is, he's uh, basically um, saying, well, you know, I'll, I'll give my life for this person, or I could possibly be giving my life for somebody. So he's not taking account of his own well-being, he's more concerned with somebody that's laying there bleeding and, and you know, needs help. So Jeff just shared that uh, he had a, had courage, he maybe had a heart of courage to, he took a risk that he could have been the next uh, victim, so to speak. He didn't know that. He didn't know if they were still there, if this was a setup or something like that. So he had, had a heart of, of courage. Good, good observation, Jeff. Bob? You know, I was just thinking, <laughs> I, I, I wonder what experiences he had had. You know, that maybe somebody had helped him out. Now, the reason I thought of that, I have to confess something, that, you know, a lot of you know I got hurt real bad in 1980. Well, I almost bled to death, and obviously somebody had given blood. Well, over the years, I've been very poor about going to the Red Cross. I've got perfectly good blood, I've, been, I've done very little. But I did the other day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and I, and I and really, and I, and I tell people, you know, I, I've thought about it a hundred times that, you know, I really should have given 500 times already, and I, and I haven't. But the reason I did, and I felt good about this, is, and I told some people, I said, you know, I, I need to give more. And, and just so you know, I'll throw a little tidbit out here you, you can donate. They're, they have a, an app now, and they've already called me. Uh, a couple of days ago, I wanted to reschedule because you have to wait eight weeks to give blood, and they have already tried to schedule me. And I've actually, I, I told them to call me that I had something going on. I wasn't sure that it would work when they wanted to, but but that's something that we can do. You know, mm -hmm. to strangers, you'll never even know who you help, but you will help somebody. Yeah. And, and even now, they test you for COVID. They test you. They tell you what type of blood they have. It's all right there, so you know all that. And we all often wonder. And then in the meantime, I think it'll even tell you what your blood's used. Yeah, I, th I think they nowadays can't tell you if it goes to Indiana or wherever. Because um, I, I donate regularly myself, and I think you're right about that. So Bob makes a point that perhaps, this, it's a story of course, but in the story perhaps he had been helped in his life, and that's why he decided to help other people. And, and doesn't that make sense? Those of us who shared uh, that someone that we didn't know stopped to check on us, doesn't that make you a little bit more willing to stop and check on someone else? 
or say like with Ross, if someone called the, the church and you were looking for some help with a vehicle breakdown, place to stay, we could probably call Ross. He'd say, you know, I'm gonna pay it forward. You know, I, I have been blessed by this in the past and I wanna to try to bless someone else in the present in a similar way. So good, good point. What else do we learn about this neighborly Samaritan, Bill? I noticed he is not at all concerned with loophole. He saw yeah. this through, yeah. all the way through to his fullest. To yeah. the point where he said, if there's a bill, I'll come back and I'll settle the rest of it. Um, so it's like the initial question the lawyer was asking wasn't even on the man's radar, this guy. Mm -hmm. Wasn't even thinking about it. Well, Bill made the, the comment that the Samaritan wasn't interested in pursuing loopholes. It wasn't even a part of his mentality. He wanted to do the right thing and, and be, be a blessing. Um, you know, uh, Ross, go ahead. I have a question. Um, maybe, maybe you know this. What's the, the, the significance of the difference between the priest being the first guy that came across this guy and the Levite? So, you know, priests come from the Levitical family, right? Right. So do you have any idea why that? Well, on a, a practical note, one, one thing I read was that the priest was like the professional religious leader and the Levite was more like the lay leader, the lay, lay religious leader. So it might be the, the difference between just in our, in our maybe comparison, we can think of a, a paid ministry person versus a regular everyday Christian, maybe. You know, that might be the easiest way for us to to translate it. That was at least one, one thing that I read. Good, good question. With a Levite, the, a Levite person, would, they were ones that helped. That was their job to help. Right. And, and he may have been a lay person, but that's what, uh, what they were set aside for and got free housing and stuff. And, Good, so he, good, good. He had an obligation. Right, so but he just shared the Levite would have a, a religious obligation to help. And, uh, you know, that, that we all do this. As believers in Jesus, we'd all have that similar obligation to help. Maybe another thing we could think about is that he went, he in, invested his day, he used his feet, he went over there, he took that risk. As Jeff mentioned, uh, he got his hands dirty, as you could say, you know, he had to bandage him and, you know, he, he had to touch him. And, you know, we, we all understand, and this is a very difficult thing for many of us during this COVID-19, that we, we all understand the power of the human touch, whether it be a hug or a handshake or, or whatever. And, uh, you know, that, that's a difficulty we have, but we see that he, he touched him and he probably was, uh, you know, somewhat uncomfortable, had to get out of his comfort zone. And, uh, you know, we, we really, his mentality is my neighbor is anyone who needs some help from me. You know, it wasn't that they live within one mile of my house or they live in the same area that I live or the same neighborhood of Great Falls or uh, Cascade or Ulm or wherever we might, might live. Um, you know, this, that's not what it's all about. It's not about proximity. It's about the need that someone might have. Ross? I was just thinking about how he was willing to, he didn't know uh, the total cost, and he, but he was willing to be responsible for future costs to take care of this guy. You know, some people would say he was invested financially. He maybe mortgaged his future. He didn't know how long this would, would go. He, he gave him a, a couple, the innkeeper, he gave him some money um, and cared for him. He invested that money. And in, in, in that, you probably have a footnote in your Bible that says it's basically worth two days' wages. So, you know, whatever that would be for you, think about investing that amount of money, you know, for whatever you make per day times two, you know. It, it's probably some more significant for some of us than others, but, uh, and even in that day and time, they suggest that that two days of wages would take care of two months' stay. Uh, 
kind of interesting. Uh, I guess the economy was a lot different than it is today. I don't think two days of my wages would take care of two months staying at an inn. <laughs> don't tell Seth. <laughs> God could multiply it, maybe. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, like Ross made, made the point, you know, he, he invested financially, uh, invested in future financially, uh, said, hey, just let me know, I'll be back, I'll reimburse you, I'll reimburse you. you know, that'd be c inconvenient, you know, he, he wasn't concerned about convenience, it seems, it seems like he was just more concerned about the need and, and meeting that need, and he had the ability to meet that need. So, anything else that you want to, to note, Bill? I would think this story kind of drives home a couple things that we say with our kids often. One of them is, if you ever start a sentence with the word technically, you're trying to get out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Second, one of the things we talk about often is being available to let God interrupt your day. Mm -hmm. And he very much Willing to let God interrupt, interrupt the day. Mm -hmm. And then the, the third thing I, I always, maybe it's just me from this story, but I always wonder how long it took the lawyer at like parting ways to realize that Jesus didn't really answer the question he asked. He kind of tweaked it a little bit and, and answered the question that Jesus wanted to answer, but not fully actually the one that the lawyer asked. Yeah. He kind of has him answer it himself, doesn't he? He turns it again and challenges him, saying, well, who, who was... As a way of telling him, this is a better question. Who was the one who loved his neighbor? Well, he answers, the one who had mercy on him. You know, so it, it is not better for us to kind of come to our own conclusions like that. So Bill made the comment that if we ever start a conversation or an answer by saying, well, technically, we're probably looking for a loophole, and then... Uh, he also shared that we need to be available and to be interrupted. And there was a third thing that I, I'm... Just that Jesus didn't really answer the question the guy asked. Okay, that Jesus didn't really answer directly the, the question that he asked. So, Bob? You know, if you think about it, just when, when Jesus talked about the two guys that walked by, it, it didn't help either one. <laughs> And, and, and it shows how, how smart Jesus was in that anyone would know that it was wrong yeah. for anybody to walk by a man laying by the side of the road who was hurt that bad. I mean, seriously. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, who in this room would say that was a good thing? I mean, none of us would say that. And, 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 I, and I guarantee you that right off the bat, he's thinking, well, that wasn't very nice for that priest to walk by. It wasn't very nice for that Levite to walk by. Right. And then, and then he's in the punchline. <laughs> What's that? And then Jesus gets in the punchline. Yeah, and then he, yeah, and then he throws a Samaritan in there. That was like a, talk about a punchline, that was a, yeah. that was a macro, that was a double history. <laughs> It'd be if we were telling the story and we said some uh, rioter from the Capitol last week uh, stopped and helped everybody. <laughs> You know, we might not be like, oh, good night. Why did you use that example? Uh, that's not what we want to talk about or hear. Well, just to kind of wrap up and uh, make some application, what uh, specific actions can we take this week to demonstrate our love to others? Uh, one thing I thought about is, even though we, we're still, you know, we have some restrictions because of COVID-19, we still have guests here. They come every Sunday. Sometimes we even have some on Wednesday, but one thing we could all try to do is to say, hey, you know, I think that person is someone I don't know. And, you know, whether they're a member or a guest, you could say, hey, my name's Scott, and, you know, just wanted to say, glad you're here, and, and you know, it could be a, a two-minute conversation. You know, but just be welcoming and inviting and accepting of, of those people who are here. And we've had, uh, I know, uh, one or two families here last couple of Sundays in a row that, you know, been here maybe two Sundays, you know, so, but, you know, January is a great time for people to try to make changes in their life, and those of us who 
know that, realize that these people are probably coming because they're trying to make a change in their life and they're looking for some spiritual resources and certainly we have the spiritual resources that can be a blessing to them. So what else could we do this week to uh, demonstrate love to others? Slow down. What's that? Slow down. Slow down. I thought that's what you said, but I wasn't sure. Well, I, I'm not always good at this, but a lot of the airmen I work with are younger and very low ranking. And um, I try to deliberately slow down when they're around to let them know that I think their time is just as valuable as mine. Right. Something I try to do, but I would say slow down. Slow down. Slow down when you're with people. Uh, don't, don't be so concerned maybe about our own agenda. Maybe you could just think of someone this week uh, that you could help meet a need for or reach out to, um, put, put their needs ahead of our own, and uh, just reach out to people in, in their time of need. That's what we're trying to do with Terry. You know, with this card, I'm sure, you know, we can't see her, and even if she was in Great Falls, we couldn't see her, but uh, most likely, but, you know, she's going through a very difficult time, and. Uh, I know the ladies sent a card, I think, last week. Was that right, Lucy? And so, you know, just something that we can do. Uh, think about those. Sometimes it's a very little thing that, that we can do that can make a big difference in people's lives. So let's go ahead and wrap up class. I think we're, we're past due a little bit. So if you have children downstairs, make sure and go pick those kiddos up right away. And uh, thanks for your participation this evening. And, Hope you have a great rest of the week.